Hello friends, myself Abhishek Mishra and I am going to discuss the international relations questions that have been asked in this year's mains exam. So as we know that the international relations portion is covered under GS paper 2 and normally we have seen that UPSC has been asking at least 50 marks questions every year from this segment and the questions from this segment are generally current oriented. So if one is well versed with current developments then these questions are somewhat easier to attempt. Now let us see the trend of these questions over the past few years. So we can see that in mains exam from GS paper 2 from the international relations portion generally since 2017 there have been 50 marks questions asked every year and under this the general breakup of the questions has been like this that we have been having two questions of 15 marks and two questions of 10 marks. So, which gives us a total of 50 marks. But other than this, also in the internal, also in the internal security segment of GS paper 3 and sometimes the questions in world history are also having the international relations dimension. But now our focus would be the international relations area of uh, questions from GS paper 2 only. So, we can see that 215 marker questions which need to be answered in around 250 words and 210 marker questions which have to be answered in around 150 words. Now these word limits become very important in the exam because if we write anything which is irrelevant it, uh, it acts as a double penalty on ourselves. How? So, when we write something irrelevant first of all it will not fetch us any mark it will also lower our impression uh, on the examiner plus you will face a word penalty and a time penalty because when we will write irrelevant stuff so definitely we will exceed the word limit and we will also ex exceed the time limit because we have to answer 20 questions in a GS paper within 180 minutes that is 3 hours. So, we need to stick to the word limit very strictly and plus minus 20 words is what uh, we can allow ourselves. So, we can exceed by 20, 30 words or we can write less by say 20 words, but we should not be exceeding it any more, right. So, that has to be the general idea. Now, from which areas of the syllabus the questions are coming? So, basically we can divide the international relations syllabus that is of GS2 under these broad headings. So, the first one is India and its neighbors and it is very important area of the syllabus. But since 2019, UPSC has not been asking any question from this area, though this remains very important. Now, from where the questions are being asked? So, UPSC has been asking from regional and global groupings. So, even this year, they have asked question on SCO, which is Shanghai Cooperation Organization and a new alliance that has been formed by Australia, UK and the US, so AUKUS, so that was asked. Then again important international developments that also impact India. So under this heading, a question has been asked about the China-US rivalry and how does it compare with the US-USSR rivalry of Cold War era, so that has been asked. Then another question that has been asked which is uh, from static portion that is India Africa and what is India's influence in Africa over the recent years. So that has been asked and uh, important international institutions have been given a miss this time and uh, last year there was a question on World Health Organization because that was in news. So, most of these topics for example, SEO this has been asked because the US troops have withdrawn from Afghanistan and it has increased the importance of a regional grouping like SEO which actually uh, has membership of the Central Asian Republics at least 4 of the Central Asian Republics are members of this along with Russia, China, India and Pakistan. So, that has given it a lot of importance. So, that has been asked this year, then AUKUS, 
So, this was a new alliance which has been formed by US to again uh, contain China. So, this was also a very direct current affairs question that has been asked by UPSC. Now, China US rivalry has been in news for the last uh, few years since the uh, Trump administration uh, engaged in a trade war with China and now US and China are involved in a uh, conflict situation in many areas. So, this has also been in news and it is a very current oriented topic that has been asked. Now, India Africa. So, this we can see as a topic which is more of static nature, but again an important area of the international relations syllabus that we discuss in class. Uh, for example, we will discuss the uh, India's relation with uh, South America or South American countries and India's relation with African countries. What is India's approach towards Africa or African development? India's uh, approach towards Africa in comparison to China's approach to Africa and how the approach is different and what India should do to gain uh, more access to the African resources. So, these are the things that we discuss in class. So, India Africa relations was also asked in this year's exam. So, this we have seen that from where uh, the questions have been asked in this year. Now, we will do one by one discussion of these four uh, questions that have been asked this year. So, now let us see the very first question. So, here we have the question on Africa and how India's influence in Africa's growth has been. So, this question uh, let us first read the question and try to understand the demand of the question because understanding the demand is very important for answering a question in UPSC civil services exam means. So, the question says that if the last few decades were of Asia's growth story, the next few are expected to be of Africa's. In the light of this statement, examine India's influence in Africa in recent years. So, the very first thing that we need to register here is that the question is in what format. So, the format of the question is that a statement has been given and the statement is followed by a question and the question state statement itself says that in light of the statement. we have to answer the question. So, one thing should be clear to us that we are not to differ with the statement or we uh, are not required to argue with the statement. Okay, we have to take the statement as a given that yes, this is true and yes, when we read the statement, we will also realize that this is the uh, something which is factual in nature. So, what it is saying that the last few decades where about Asia's growth story. So, we know that uh, the 21st century has been built as Asia's century and especially China and India have been the major Asian countries which have been registering very impressive growth rates. So, it was all about Asia's growth story for the last few decades, but now it seems that the momentum is shifting towards Africa. So, that is the statement. So, this we need to be clear about and now how to answer this question. So, first of all whenever such a statement is given and it has been asked that we have to answer the question in the light of the statement, then we must write few points or we must give few points about that statement substantiating the statement that yes, if the momentum of growth is shifting towards African countries, then what is the reason for that, why it is happening. Okay. And if we can give some examples that yes, this is happening because of these reasons, then it is always better. So, we will start the answer by giving some points about how Africa has been leading the growth rate in the world or how Africa is acting as a growth pole for the entire world. So, that will be the first part. In the second part, we have to examine. So, a command word has been given examine. So, examine means that we ne need to look very carefully, look carefully about what? About India's influence in Africa in recent years. So, we also need to note 
that we should not be talking here about the age old story about India and Africa. So, in recent years, pointedly it has been asked. So, once we understand this, that means we have understood the demand of the question. The second part is all about writing the answer. And for every means question, we are basically having around 8 and half minutes to answer, to write the full answer. So, initial part, we understand the demand of the question, then we brainstorm and jot down some points that come to our mind about the question. Then the final thing is about writing a effective answer. And the format of the answer has to be like this only, that there has to be intro if required. This can also be, this is very optional in GS. That means, if you have time and if you can, if you want to write intro, then only you should write, otherwise you come straight to the point and it has to be covered maximum in one to two lines. Then we come to the body where we basically answer the question. If there are multiple parts, then you write answer of part 1, part 2 and so on. And finally, this is important. While we can let go of the intro part, this is optional, but the conclusion is a must. We must conclude every answer and here we, it has to be done in 2 to 3 lines where we basically conclusion is summing up our argument or summing up our answer. So, this is the format of the answer that we need to keep. Now, here let us see that what we will do in the first part. So, in the first part, it is all about Africa's growth story that how Africa is going to be the growth pole for the entire world. So, here we can give some points. For example, here I have written down four points which substantiate uh, the very point that yes, the momentum is now shifting towards Africa and Africa will now act as a growth pole for the entire world. So, here we can say that uh, through the recent uh, reports, we have come to know that the top 10 economies in the last decade that is from 2010 to 2020, if we look at the top 10 economies which registered the highest growth rates, then around 6 countries out of 10 were from Africa. So, that shows that the growth momentum is shifting towards Africa. So, that is point number 1. This we can cite. Then second is about the population or the demographic dividend. Again, Africa is home to a young population and population of over 1 billion makes Africa a huge market. Plus, this added to the combined GDP of all African countries, which comes to around dollar 2.5 trillion. So, this makes it a very lucrative market for the companies of the world. So, that also adds to Africa's heft. So, this can be our second point. Third, we will talk about Africa as a resource rich country, a country which is rich in natural resources. So, that has always been the case, but mostly in Africa's case, it has been about a resource curse that the resources of Africa has been utilized by other countries of the world. So, Africa has been exploited, but now with African countries free from colonialism and they are free to chart their own course. So, this is now changing and Africa or African countries are now able to utilize their resources for their own prosperity. So, Africa is rich in resources of crude oil, gas, precious metals to name few. So, this should be our third point. Then we can also talk about the recent free trade agreement that the African Union has uh, come up with, which is the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Now, this Continental Free Trade Agreement is the largest one or the largest free trade agreement since the coming on the scene of World Trade Organization. So, after the coming of World Trade Organization, this is the largest. And what it will do? It will further improve the trade between African countries and this will also help Africa to grow even faster. So, these are some of the points because see in the mains exam, we cannot keep 
uh, giving endless number of points. So, we have to talk about the most important points and as soon as possible. So, if we can give these four points, so what we can do? We have substantiated the first, first part that yes, the growth momentum has shifted from Asia to Africa and over the next few years or next few decades, Africa is where the action is going to be in terms of economic growth. So, after having done that, we come to the second part of the question where we need to talk about the influence of India in Africa over the recent years. Now, when we talk about India's influence in Africa, so the very first thing that should come to our mind is that India is locked in a competition over African resources with China. So, there has been a competition between Indian companies and Chinese companies to gain access to uh, resources in African countries and China has been largely winning this battle because of its checkbook diplomacy and its deep pockets. So, India cannot match uh, with the Chinese uh, money power, but the thing that India has in its favor is the social capital that India has over the years and India has a long historical association with uh, African countries and uh, that started with the colonial period and uh, Indian diaspora is also present in huge numbers in African countries. So, all of this has given India a lot of social capital plus the way India does business in Africa is markedly different from how China does it. So, China or Chinese companies uh, have faced lot of resistance from uh, the local Africans because when Chinese companies do their work in Africa, they do not employ locals while Indian companies when they do work in Africa, they employ locals. Uh, and India has always been at the forefront of capacity building of Africans uh, through its various training programs and other initiatives. So, that is a, a, a difference between India's approach to Africa and Chinese approach to Africa, but still we need to be careful that this has not been asked in the question. So, this can be only one point in our answer. So, how or what we should write here? So, when we are talking about India's influence in Africa, we should first of all talk about the multifaceted approach that India has taken in recent years. So, this multifaceted approach involves projects which are being implemented under India's lines of credit. So, India has been giving grants to African countries as well as concessional loans to African countries that is part one. Then India is engaged in capacity building initiatives with the African countries and it is much appreciated by the African countries because ultimately that is skilling of the um, African population. Then thirdly, India has been cooperating with African countries in a range of sectors. So, across sectors India has been helping out the African countries. So, this is the first part where we talk about the multifaceted approach of India towards Africa. Then we can also write this thing that Africa is considered a priority of India's foreign policy. So, it is a priority region, it is not a neglected region. So, it has become a foreign policy priority for India and the bilateral trade between India and Africa is around $55 billion. So, it has shrunk a bit, uh, the highest point it has reached was in 20, around 2015, where it was around $72 billion. But it has come down uh, also because of the COVID-19 pandemic that has affected Africa, India and almost the entire world. But still, it is a significant uh, trade that India has with Africa and there is lot of potential to improve it. Then we can also talk about the peacekeeping operations of which India is a huge part in the African countries. Many of the African countries are having civil war situations. So, there whenever there is a UN peacekeeping mission, so India has always contributed forces. So, India is also well regarded in that manner. Finally, we also talk about the competition with China, where we just say that uh, India and China are locked in a fight to gain access to the uh, resources of Africa, but also to become partner of choice for the African countries. Now, here China has been having some edge over India 
but again we talk about India's social capital in Africa. So, we have to talk about the social capital that India has with African countries through its long association, the NAM movement and so on, where African countries are also more comfortable dealing with India. And finally, we have to talk about the over 3 million people of Indian origin in Africa, the Indian diaspora in Africa, which also plays a big role in having good India-Africa relations. So, these are the points that we can write in this answer. So, now let us see the question once again. So, here we have substantiated the first part, which is the statement by giving points in favor of how Africa is becoming a growth pole for the entire world. And in the next part, we have talked about India's influence in Africa in recent years. Then we can also cite the names of various initiatives and programs uh, which India has undertaken in African countries. But this is how we should be approaching this question. Now we will move on to the next question. This question has been framed by the UPSC in a very interesting manner that it is asking about the comparison between the US China rivalry with US USSR rivalry or US Soviet Union. So, let us read the question. So, the question is saying that the US is facing an existential threat. So, this word is important that US is facing an existential threat in the form of China that is much more challenging than the erstwhile Soviet Union and we have to explain it. Now, whenever the command word explain is there, we have to understand that we need to give reasons. So, here also again the format of the question is that there is a statement given and followed by a question and the question is just a command word which says explain that is we have to provide reasons that why this is so. So, again we are not required to question that no this is not like that it is not uh, that uh, China is uh, giving US tougher competition than the erstwhile Soviet Union. Uh, this we need not do. What we have to do is we need to answer the question and that is that we have to take the statement as a given that yes this is the case that China is becoming or uh, is a more formidable challenge to US than the erstwhile Soviet Union and we have to look at the reasons or provide the reasons why it is so. So, this in a way is a more direct question, but at the same time we have to uh, remain very much focused on what the question is asking and supply that information only because answer has to be written only in 150 words. That means, if you are writing around 10 words in one line. So, that means 15 to 17 lines is the maximum that we can afford for this answer. Now, US and China, they have been locked in a bitter struggle. Basically, they are into an open trade war. So, that started with the Trump administration, which was imposing lot of, uh, uh, which hide the custom duties over the Chinese imports and China also retaliated. So, after that, uh, even when the uh, president has changed in US, still US China are very much on confrontational terms over a range of areas. So, let us see which are the areas where US and China are attacking each other. So, normally uh, what we can see that US attacks China basically for its anti-democratic political system. So, China is a one party rule. So, it is an authoritarian state and uh, basically US is always countering China about its anti-democratic measures that it is taking in uh, places such as Hong Kong. So, that is one. Then the Uyghur Muslim issue. Now, we know that the Uyghur Muslims, they are present in this province of uh, China, which is called Xinjiang. So, now these Uyghur Muslims, they are facing lot of repression by the Chinese authorities and this has become a major uh, flashpoint between US and China. 
again us is accusing china all the time about this opaque trade practices so there are a lot of hidden subsidies that china is providing to its companies and because of that the chinese companies are able to flood world markets with their products which are much cheaper and that is resulting in losses for these other countries so this has been a major issue about the opaque trade practices that the chinese uh, government and the chinese companies follow then china has also been uh, acting very aggressively in the indo pacific region and especially in the south china sea where it has come up with a nine dash line and it claims almost the entire area and it is sometimes said that what china basically wants is that it should be a south china lake so china wants to convert it into a south china lake with its total sovereignty over that water body so these are some of the areas where us attacks china and now let us see where china is attacking us so china is also accusing us of double standards and it says that you are not looking internally you are lecturing the entire world about uh, uh, so many things that how you should treat your minorities and all but at the same time there is lot of racial discrimination that is happening within us also and uh, it uh, blew up with the uh, with some cases of racial tensions in united states which also led to lot of violence so china attacks us over these racial tensions and it is also attacking us that what us is basically wanting it talks about democracy but basically what us is wanting according to china is to extend its hegemony in the world and it sees china as a rival and that is why it is disturbed so that is what china's uh, perception is then china has also been very much critical of the afghanistan mishandling by us where us left after 20 years but it did not leave uh after making afghanistan a better place so it has left afghanistan after causing lot of destruction over the 20 years and it has not been able to uh, transplant democracy in afghanistan and uh, taliban seized power in afghanistan once the us troops withdrew so that also uh, is one area where china claims that us tries to uh, police the world but it is not capable of it and it is only wanting to extend its hegemony over the other countries so this we know but this is just the basic introduction of the question that why us and china are attacking each other and on what grounds but the question is basically asking us something which is little bit different than this so that is why we should not go just by the keywords now here what the statement is saying that us is facing an existential threat that means a very serious threat which can actually uh, uh, which raises question about its existence only okay so it's a question of survival for us so that kind of formidable challenge is being posed by china and the question is saying that this challenge is much more serious than the one uh, us faced from the erstwhile soviet union and we have to give reasons for that so what should be our reasons for uh, that part so this is a direct question and we can simply start by writing about the points so in the intro part what we can do is basically we will talk about that for united states china has emerged as a very formidable challenge and yes in many respects it is a much more uh, um, or a much bigger threat than that was posed by the erstwhile soviet union and then we will talk about the various reasons for that so here we can write that china has emerged as the biggest threat or a more formidable threat for united states because of its economic power its military power and its capacity to challenge the us hegemony because if we look at the world then yes we talk about a multipolar world but the reality is that if we have to pick one superpower then us is that superpower but us is in retreat so that is a bigger problem that us is in retreat and china is rising so it is a us retreat versus rise of china and that is what the question is focusing 
So, uh, what points we can cite here? So, we can simply uh, after introduction where we tell about the challenge that is being posed by China to US, then we come to the reasons why China is bigger existential threat than USSR and while writing the answer maybe we can just separate it through a subheading. So, we can just underline it so that it is very clear that now we are answering the question. So, the first point that we can give here is that the US economy is much more dependent on the Chinese economy than the USSR uh, was ever able to do with respect to US. So, US economy was never actually dependent on the uh, Soviet Union's economy. Okay. Soviet Union and its allies during the Cold War period, they were isolated or cut off from the uh, other block. So, there was no economic dependence. But now, in the case of China, we can see that the US economy itself is dependent on the Chinese economy. So, they are closely linked together, the economies of the two countries. So, it is not very easy for US to impose any kind of sanctions and not face the uh, ripple effect of that sanction. So, that makes it more difficult for US to take any uh, unilateral action against China. So, the first point can be that US economy is dependent on China unlike USSR, so which makes the challenge much more serious. Second is the USSR was actually composed of several republics. So, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So, there were many republics and many nationalities within that uh, country. But in the case of China, it is a single nation. So, one single nationality largely. So, that also makes China a much uh, potent threat than compared to USSR. The third point we can write is that the Chinese companies are also at the forefront of technology, for example, the 5G. So, Chinese companies like Huawei, they have uh, done lot of work and they are at an advanced stage in terms of the critical technologies. While USSR uh, in comparison, US always had a lead over USSR in this respect. But now in these technologies, the Chinese uh, companies are giving US a run for its money. So, that makes the challenge that much more formidable. After this, we can also talk about that when US was competing with USSR, it was all about a growing US which was in competition with USSR during the Cold War era. But now what we see that while uh, China is rising, the US seems to be in a retreat. So, that is another factor. So, that also makes the challenge from uh, China that much more serious as compared to the challenge from Soviet Union. Then finally, what we can write is that there is internal political divisions uh, that came to the forefront during this uh, incident that happened at the US Capitol uh, when uh, this uh, transition of government was taking place. So, that shows that there is lot of internal political division within US, whereas China is an authoritarian system. So, it has its own advantages, where US being a democracy, there is bound to be difference of opinion and which is openly expressed. So, that also makes it more challenging for US to uh, counter the Chinese threat. So, these points can be given in our answer while discussing this question, but finally, uh, we can say that yes, uh, Chinese threat is much more complex for US to handle than the threat which was posed by USSR. So, this is how we should answer this question. Now, we will see the next one. So, now let us move on to the next question. So, the next question is about SEO and it is basically uh, asking us about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, then the question says that critically examine the aims and objectives of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in short called as SCO and what importance does it hold for India? Answer is to be written in 250 words. So, if you are writing around 10 words per line, then this question has to be written in around 25 to 27 lines. So, why this SCO? question has come. So, basically 
one of the biggest event or the current event or international development last year uh, was the seizing of power by Taliban in Afghanistan and that has created a difficult security situation for all the countries in the neighborhood. And India also considers itself to be part of the neighborhood of Afghanistan. And uh, the importance of a grouping, a regional grouping like SEO has increased manifold because of this. Even otherwise, uh, the membership of SEO includes countries like Russia, countries like uh, China and now India and Pakistan are also its members and four Central Asian republics. Except Turkmenistan, all the Central Asian republics are part of this grouping. So, that increases its value and significance. So, again here we can see that there is a different format of this question. So, now this question is in two parts. So, which are the two parts of this question? So, the first part is asking us to critically examine. Okay. So, examine is basically looking at something very carefully that we look at things which are obvious and not so obvious. Okay. But when it is critically, then we have to look at it more carefully. Okay. And maybe some things which are not otherwise known about something, that also needs to be highlighted in such questions. So, we have to critically examine the aims and objectives of SEO. So, it is not just about mentioning the aims and objectives of SEO, but maybe something which is hidden, uh, which is uh, implicit in the grouping that also needs to be brought out in our answer. So, that we have to do. So, first part is basically about the aims and objectives of SEO. Then in the second part, what has been asked that what importance does it hold for India? So, it is importance of SEO for India. Now, here we need to understand one more thing that sometimes in international relations we will find that countries are part of groupings which seem to be at odds with each other. For example, uh, now India is part of SCO which includes Russia and China, but at the same, same time India is also part of a grouping like Quad which includes US, Japan, Australia and India. Here also India is there along with other countries. Now, Quad and SCO because in Quad which is the leading country United States and the two leading countries in SCO are basically Russia and China. Now, US and Russia and China, they are on the opposite sides. So, how does India balance being in Quad and uh, being in SEO? So, that is something which uh, is very commonplace in international relations. So, you will find a country like Turkey, which is also part of NATO and also engaged in various multilateral forums and groupings with countries like Russia and uh, China. So, this is very much commonplace in international relations. So, and that has also not been asked, but I am just telling you that uh, if a question comes even about India's role in a grouping like Quad and India's role in a grouping like SEO. So, we need to understand that in a multipolar world, any country will have to act as per its international or as per, its, uh, as per the international environment and its national interests. So, every country has to pursue its national interest. Now, uh, uh, another significant difference between Quad and SEO for India is that Quad is basically focused on a geography which is Indo-Pacific. So, it is basically something which is uh, having uh, what orientation towards the sea, okay, marine security is what uh, it is after. Whereas, uh, SEO is focused on continental security. So, when India is part of SEO and Quad, it is not at conflict with each other and yes, India will need to walk a tightrope, but that is the case with almost all the countries which are at times part of such divergent groupings. Now, here we have understood that the question has been asked in two parts and the first part is about aims and objectives of SEO, which we need to critically examine. 
and second is about the importance of SEO for India. So, let us see what we need to write in the first part. So, in the first part we will talk about the objectives and aims for which SEO was founded and before that we should also know and maybe in introduction we can uh, give because it is a question of 250 words that has to be written in 250 words. So, we can give a basic brief intro in uh, one or two lines or two three lines. So, where we talk about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it was established in 2000 and the original members of this grouping were Russia, China and the four Central Asian Republics which includes countries like Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, then Tajikistan and we have Uzbekistan. Only country which is not part of this uh, SEO grouping, but it is a part of the Central Asian Republics when we talk about Central Asian Republics that is Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan follows a policy of neutrality in international uh, affairs. So, it is not part of such grouping. Now, headquarter of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, this is also important again uh, from per prelims perspective also, because if there is an option that where is the headquarter of SEO, then maybe because of the name Shanghai Cooperation Organization, there may be a temptation that Shanghai must be the uh, headquarter of this uh, organization, but the right answer is Beijing and at present it has 8 members. So, originally there were 6 members, but India and Pakistan were given full membership in 2017 of SCU. So, now it is having 8 members. Then what is the geopolitical significance of SCO? So, it comprises or the member countries comprise almost 60 percent of the Eurasian landmass. Then it also comprises of 35 percent of the world's population thanks to India and China which are part of this grouping. Then uh, the Central Asian republics and also Russia, they are having massive fossil fuel resources and this grouping also has major energy consumers in India and China. Then it is a very powerful regional grouping and as the membership uh, indicates that it is a important regional grouping and uh, very important. It is also seen as a counterweight to NATO. So, now we will see the aims and objectives for which SEO has been established. So, after giving a very brief intro of SEO, then we move to the next part of the question, which is basically uh, the question itself, uh, the first part, which is asking us about the aims and objectives of SEO. So, there we can talk about uh, the first objective, which is to increase cooperation in political, military, economic, energy and cultural fields among the member countries. So, this is the objective which is uh, of all the organization, generally all the regional groupings or global groupings will have such kind of uh, statement in their uh, objectives that they want to increase cooperation in various fields. Now, the second is interesting that uh, SEO has its focus on combating three evils and what are these three evils? So, SEO wants to combat this tendency of separatism, terrorism and extremism. So, this is a stated aim of SEO. So, this we should be writing. Then it is also very deeply focused on regional security issues. In fact, this is the prime focus of SEO as a regional grouping that it is focused on regional security issues. And SEO because it has Russia and China as its members. So, it is also seen as a counter to US or NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So, this is something which is not a very obvious objective or explicit objective of uh, SEO, but again because uh, the question is critically uh, examine the aims and objectives. So, there we should give a point like this that yes, it is also seen as a counter to NATO and its outreach toward from the western Europe towards eastern Europe. So, that is why Russia and China, they also see it as a counterweight to the growing US influence and NATO's outreach in the eastern Eurasian region. So, this also we can cite. 
So, this is basically the aims and objectives of SEO, which will cover our first part of the answer. Then after this, we will move to the second part, which is to be given more importance, because again, it does not mean that a question has been asked in two parts, that we have to give 50 50 percent weightage to both the parts. We also need to look at the importance. So, here in this question, the aims and objectives of any organization cannot be uh, given a very detailed explanation that has to be covered in few points and we have given five points for that. But the next part becomes more important that is why India is more interested in this grouping and what is the groupings importance for India. So, let us see what we can write here. So, basically uh, the first point we can give here is that SEO is dealing with the continental neighborhood of India. So, the land neighbors of India, they are connected through this SU grouping and it gives a gateway uh, to India to reach the Central Asian republics, which are rich in mineral resources. They are rich in fossil fuel reserves and India has been wanting a access to these uh, countries, which has been denied by Pakistan. So, basically India has been looking at a route which was earlier uh, when a favorable regime was in Afghanistan. So, India was wanting that through Chabihar, Chabahar port uh, via Iran and Afghanistan, it could reach the Central Asian republics. But now with uh, Afghanistan falling into uh, the hands of Taliban, India's uh, approach has been again limited. But that is why a grouping like SEO is that much more important because it gives direct access uh, for India to engage in dialogue with the Central Asian republics. So, that is very important point that we must mention. Then in the grouping itself of SEO, India has different kind of uh, relationship with all the member countries. So, for example, India has a strategic partner and friend in Russia. So, India has had very close relationship with Russia uh, since the time of Soviet Union and it continues. Then India also has two adversarial neighbors as part of SEO. Uh, one is Pakistan, other is China. Then uh, what is most important for, S, uh, for India in SEO is these four Central Asian republics of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. So, these four Central Asian republics getting access to them uh, engaging in regular dialogue with them, that is the, uh, the most important benefit that uh, India gets from this SEO membership. Then finally, in third point, we can write that SEO can help India to deepen ties with Russia. Also, it helps India to monitor and counter the influence of Pakistan and China in the regional security environment. So, anything which China and Pakistan are doing, so uh, if India is also present in SEO, so as a grouping, SEO cannot uh, take any decision which is directly inimical to India's interest. So, uh, that is also another reason why India's presence in SEO is important. Then it will also help India to expand cooperation with the Central Asian Republics, which is the prime motive of India to be part of SEO and the Central Asian Republics are actually the focus of India's economic diplomacy that is carried out through this grouping SEO. Finally, we can also write that SEO is a very important forum for India to deal with its regional security concerns, especially after Taliban seizing power in Afghanistan. So, all the member countries of SEO they actually have a working relationship with Taliban except for India and that is again uh, another area where SEO membership helps India to maybe engage with Taliban and also impress upon the other uh, member countries of SEO that what kind of uh, regime should be in uh, Afghanistan. Even Taliban can be uh, persuaded to have a more inclusive form of government which works uh, to the interest of India. So, uh, those kind of things are also possible through the membership of SEO. 
So, this is what we should be writing in this question and that is how we should answer this question. So, now let us see the next question and uh, the next question is about AUKUS. Now, this AUKUS is a new security alliance that has been established by US, UK and Australia and uh, it has been in news. So, it is a very current oriented question that the UPSC has asked and a direct question. So, let us first of all try to understand the demand of this question. So, this question is saying that the newly tri nation partnership AUKUS is aimed at countering China's ambitions. So, let us see it is talking about the newly formed partnership AUKUS and it is saying that it is aimed at countering China's ambitions in the China's ambitions in the Indo Pacific region. So, again the format of the question is again a statement. Then secondly it says that is it going to supersede the existing partnerships in the region and thirdly it is asking discuss the strength and impact of AUKUS in the present scenario. So, we have to discuss the strength and impact of AUKUS in the present scenario. So, what is the format of this question? We have a statement followed by two questions. Right. So, the statement is that uh, the AUKUS is aimed at countering China's ambitions in the Indo Pacific. So, again we will give some points that establishes that yes uh, AUKUS uh, what is the purpose of AUKUS. So, how it is a security alliance and how it will uh, counter the China's ambitions in the Indo Pacific region. After that we will go to the next part which is which is uh, where we will answer that is it going to supersede the existing partnerships in the region and thirdly we will move on to discuss the strength and impact of AUKUS in the present scenario. So, for this let us first of all look at AUKUS that what is basically AUKUS. So, AUKUS is an out and out security alliance. And unlike Quad, where it has always been uh, the aim of the other three countries except for US to project it as a organization or as a grouping, which is not based uh, on any uh, idea of containing China, it has a broad objective. So, India, Australia and Japan, they have all been reiterating this fact only US has been more aggressive against China even in quiet, but the other countries have played it safe. But with AUKUS there is a difference, it is clearly a security alliance and aimed against China, aimed against China in the sense that AUKUS will try to have a free open rules based and inclusive. Indo Pacific. So, whenever uh, countries like US they talk about a free open rules based and inclusive uh, Indo Pacific region. So, China takes it personally because it seems to China that through this free open rules based and inclusive uh, kind of Indo Pacific region it is being targeted right. So, China takes uh, this personally and it has not been happy with the formation of AUKUS as well. Whereas, why the need for AUKUS when already an arrangement like Quad was present. So, here we need to understand that the objective of Quad and the countries which are part of it which include countries like India, Australia, Japan and US. So, here also Australia, Japan and US they are also allies. Whereas, India is a country which is a partner country, India is not an ally of US. So, that is a difference that has been created and the objective of Quad has been more uh, like is more broad based, it is uh, not a security alliance by any means. But yes, uh, 
one of its purpose could be seen as also countering the influence of China in the Indo-Pacific region, but not through military means, but through other uh, cooperative activities. Plus, Quad has this possibility of including more countries. So, we can have a Quad plus and Quad plus plus kind of arrangement. But as far as AUKUS is concerned, the nomenclature itself where A stands for Australia, UK stands for UK and United States is US. So, the nomenclature itself reveals that this is going to be a close kind of partnership and no other country will be made part of it. So, AUKUS, uh, this basic idea about AUKUS and basic difference with Quad we need to know. Quad is more broad based, it is not a security alliance. It is aimed at providing vaccines, it is aimed at uh, uh, doing research in critical technologies, it is also aimed at keeping the Indo-Pacific region free, open, rules based and inclusive and it is also open to having more countries as its member members going forwards. But whereas AUKUS is an out and out security alliance and it is limited to these three countries. And it has a very specific focus of providing Australia with nuclear powered submarines. And why these nuclear powered submarines are very important? So, these submarines, uh, the nuclear powered submarines will help Australia to increase and uh, counter the growing Chinese presence in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, especially China has been threatening countries like uh, Japan, Australia and uh, other countries in the South China Sea, also Taiwan. So, uh, with Australia getting access to this nuclear powered submarines, it will uh, help Australia in uh, projecting its uh, naval power in that region and countering the Chinese naval power more effectively. So, that is one of the prime aim of this AUKUS alliance. So, after understanding this, now let us look at the next part of the question. So, in the very first part, we should be writing about the AUKUS. So, we can write things like that, what is the aim of the AUKUS? So, AUKUS is aimed at countering China's ambitions in Indo-Pacific region. So, that is the given statement. Now, we have to substantiate such statements. So, we can give these two, three points in favor of this. So, the first point is that it is a new security alliance. So, there is no uh, like two ways about uh, call, calling it a security alliance while with quiet we always need to be careful that it is not an security alliance, but AUKUS is a purely a security alliance of three countries that want a free open rules based and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Second point is the aim of AUKUS is to primarily equip Australia with nuclear powered submarines, which will allow the Australian uh, Navy to go for longer patrols in the region and also have a stronger military presence to counter Chinese influence. Thirdly, US and its allies are also concerned with China's aggressive posture in the South China Sea and also in the Indo-Pacific region. especially. Uh, against countries like Japan, Taiwan and Australia. So, to counter this, this AUKUS alliance has been formed by the US. So, this will be the first part of the question where we will justify or give points justifying the statement that has been given. In the next part, a small question has been asked that is it going or is AUKUS going to supersede the existing partnerships or arrangements in the region. So, one arrangement that obviously comes to mind is the Quad. Now, AUKUS is not going to supersede, rather it is going to complement Quad. And similarly, uh, that uh, goes or that is true for the other kind of arrangements. For example, Quad recognizes the centrality of ASEAN, the association of Southeast Asian countries, the centrality of ASEAN for the Indo-Pacific region. So, similarly, AUKUS also will act complementary to that. It will not try to supersede these arrangements, but it remains a security alliance. So, that point needs to be made here. So, we can write that it complements instead of superseding similar partnerships or arrangements. 
So, uh, we can cite few examples here. So, the Five Eyes Intelligence Cooperation Initiative, which also includes Australia and New Zealand. So, that is also going to be there and it will also be supplemented and complemented by this AUKUS. Secondly, ASEAN, the centrality of ASEAN to Indo-Pacific region is recognized by Quad, and so is the case with AUKUS. So, it will also not be in conflict with ASEAN. Then thirdly, Quad. So, because the membership is such that UK is the only uh, party, US and Australia are again members of Quad. So, there is uh, no reason to see that uh, there will be any conflict between uh, AUKUS and Quad. So, both will complement and supplement each other. Now, there have been some issues expressed or concerns expressed by countries like France and New Zealand. So, New Zealand's concern is basically that uh, it has felt left out of this uh, alliance plus it has a strong, uh, it has very strong views on uh, nuclear non-proliferation. So, it does not want that uh, nuclear powered submarines should enter its territorial waters. So, uh, New Zealand has raised objection to AUKUS on this ground that uh, the surrounding waters Australia should not bring its nuclear powered submarines. So, that is the concern of New Zealand. Now, France has been unhappy about this deal because of uh, commercial reasons uh, where Australia cancelled a multi billion dollar agreement uh, with France, where France was supposed to supply uh, diesel powered submarines to Australia. So, that was a very big contract that France lost out. So, France was unhappy about this. Uh, but other than this, uh, the only country which has basically objected to the formation of AUKUS has been China, because uh, obviously and for obvious reasons, because China is the country uh, against which this grouping is aimed. So, China's opposition is to be expected. So, in this part, we can answer it like this. So, this is a small part of the question. Then we come to the third part, where we have to talk about the strengths and impact of AUKUS in the uh, Indo-Pacific region and in countering China. So, basically here we need to expand on these three points that first of all we will talk about that how this AUKUS is a powerful new defense alliance to counter China in Indo-Pacific and why it is needed. So, basically many countries in the Indo-Pacific region, they have been facing this Chinese uh, uh, aggression and where China has uh, not followed the rules, international rules and uh, 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 for example, in the case of Philippines, some example can be given where China has refused to accept the order given by UN clause. So, uh, such kind of things have uh, made it very problematic for the countries to deal with the rise of an aggressive China. So, US wants to maintain uh, this Indo-Pacific regions as a free, open, inclusive and rules based area and for that such kind of alliance was needed. So, we talk about this. Secondly, uh, with Quad, the US was not getting proper traction to uh, militarily uh, counter the Chinese rise and now with the formation of AUKUS, uh, it will allow US to equip Australia with this nuclear powered submarines. And nuclear power does not mean that they will be armed with nuclear weapons, they will be only powered with uh, nuclear power and that will allow the Australian Navy to counter the Chinese uh, naval threat in the Indo-Pacific region. So, that is another point that we will uh, say or we can write in this. And thirdly, what we need to uh, address in this question is that the purpose of AUKUS is very specific, unlike Quad, which is more broad based. So, it is a security alliance, it is very specific, it has uh, its aim to counter the Chinese uh, threat against uh, the allies of US and to ensure that the Indo Pacific region remains free, open, inclusive, and rules based. So, this is how we need to answer this question. And in this question, basically, we will be talking about 
first of all justifying the statement by giving points in support of AUKUS that what it is and uh, for what purpose it has been formed. Then we will answer the first part which is, it, uh, which is about what it is going to do to the existing partnership in the region. So, it is going to complement them and we can also talk about uh, countries like Russia, uh, countries like France and New Zealand raising their objection on certain grounds. Then after this we will come to the strength and impact of AUKUS in the present scenario. And we can always cite that why AUKUS is needed uh, when you already have a grouping like quad, but that has to be done in uh, the very end where we can write two three lines about why quad is more broad based and generic while AUKUS is very specific and for a particular reason and it is a security alliance. So, with this we come to the end of our discussion of the IR questions, hope you liked it, thank you.